Hi, this is Dr. Carol Francis, and let's talk tonight about what it's like when you have suffered abuse and trauma in relationships previously. What it's like to transition into a relationship that's better and maybe really healthy, especially during the times that it becomes disharmonious. And this is also true for all couples, whether or not you have any history of abuse or trauma in either of your partnership's history. It's very important to know that you're going to spend a period of your relationship in harmony and a period of your relationship in disharmony. And during the times that you're in harmony, enjoy every moment that you have. You, in a sense, are in sync. You're synchronized. You're organized around each other. You're flowing like a really good team. You know, it's smooth sailing. So you want to really beautifully enjoy the times that you have harmony together. Now, in abusive relationships, there's also periods of times that are harmonious, and they usually follow a little bit after an abusive situation has occurred, there's been a pause, there's been regret, there's been a recommitment to the efforts between each other, and then it flows into kind of this harmony. And that harmony is because there is a belief that once again, we're going to get this together. We're going to make this happen. There's also belief that the abuser will never abuse again. And there's also belief um, that the abusee is going to be able to do everything that the abuser needs them to do. And that's a real setup for future abuse. But nonetheless, it's this period of harmony. Now, in normal relationships, there's periods of harmony for all different reasons. The temperament of both people, everything's going along fine, and so forth and so on. So it's great that you have these periods of harmony. Now, in both healthy relationships and in abusive relationships, of course, you're going to shift into disharmonious moments. Now, the real difference between an abusive relationship and a relationship that's healthy in disharmonious moments, in conflict moments, in moments when you are not in sync and you even feel like you hate each other, maybe you're arguing. But the real difference between it is that the abused does not exist. So, for example, a disharmonious moment does not include radical name calling and denigrations, making anybody trying to feel small. And, you know, you have to be careful. That's verbal abuse. Um, You also have to not resort to any sort of verbal threat so that a person would feel unsafe that you would actually do something that would harm yourself or someone else. That would be an emotional abusive exchange. You also have to not be involved in pushing or hitting or forcing or pressuring or cornering or anything that's going to make a person feel like they're about to be overpowered or if they do something wrong, it could escalate into something worse. And of course, short of actual physical complications, it can still be physical abuse by way of threat. But then, of course, as soon as it starts moving into any sort of physical contact that is harmful and painful, you have really shifted into a physical abusive situation. And you have to realize um, it could be minor, it could be major, but you have to realize that you've shifted into an abusive dynamic and that the disharmony between the two of you blew up in this difficult situation. But... That's an abusive situation. In a good relationship, there's still this dark, disharmonious moments. You disagree, you argue, you shout, you might name call, but it's not like to harm the other person. You express yourself frustratedly, you might even curse, but in a way that's kind of part of the comfortable vernacular of your relationship where both people are equally able to do it and the cursing doesn't feel threatening. You know, it's not like those words are necessarily abusive, but it is the way in which those words, whatever they are between the two of you can become threatening or intimidating uh, or make another person feel really small or bad about themselves. So you have to know that in this disharmonious time, you are not in the flow with each other at all. You are disconnected. Uh, It would be advisable for couples often to separate during this time. It would be advisable for both people to cool down. And just by some sort of sense of understanding, there is some research that indicates that when your brain begins to be inflamed and really shifts over a certain tipping point, it then takes anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes for the brain to actually cool down. And there's no reasoning, no conversation, no attempts at comfort or or 
or reuniting that really work during that cool down period. You really just need to cool down. And that is the value of having timeouts and cool down with kids too. Because you're going to have disagreement with your kids. You're going to have disagreement with your partner. And you don't need to see this time of separating for just a cool down period as a jeopardy for the relationship. You don't have to always try to fix everything in the moment because sometimes it just aggravates things, right? So instead what you do is you give yourself the cool down space and then maybe you come back at a later time and you can actually talk about remedies and solutions. Now, I would love to work with you because I work with couples, been working with people for 40 years, making their lives uh, happy together. That doesn't mean that they don't have arguments, but happy together, harmonious most of the time and able to handle the disharmony. I could talk to you about all sorts of different techniques and tools to be able to work your way through the disharmonious moments and flow back into harmony. But the most important thing for you to remember is that in the state of disharmony, harmony between the two of you, is to always treat your partner with respect and yourself with respect. So that there's this mutual respect, even though you're in a state of disagreement, you are respectful of one another. And that is the cornerstone of a healthy relationship in a disharmonious situation. I know there's lots of different metaphors I could give you. And so what I'm going to give you is like in music. If you have one instrument, let's just take a trumpet, and you have another instrument, and look at I made a different type of trumpet, and they're blowing the sounds at odds, and they're overshouting each other, or they're playing disharmonious notes, or they're out of rhythm with each other. There's this competition between the sound that gets nowhere. It does not create a melody, does not create a sound, it's not the least bit appealing. And you might think of your relationship during these disharmonious times as both of you being so much in your own trumpet that you, you really can't create a solutions or, or see things sympathetically or empathically. And you need to go back to the point where you can actually go to communicate. And I teach about reflective communication during this time and giving yourself times out and being able to uh, talk in a respectful tone regardless of the circumstances. But now let's shift to what that looks like in an abusive situation. In an abusive situation, you can go to the same sort of competition, but instead of pulling back and saying, we really just can't talk right now, instead of giving each other the cool down period, they escalate and escalate and escalate and escalate. They are in each other's face. Now, on some really kind of sick level, sometimes the abusiveness occurs to create this intense sensation of connection. But it's abusive connection. But, you know, some people starve for connection no matter what type of connection, abusive or loving. You know, they starve for connection. If they can't have it lovingly, they might actually have it abusively. Another situation that's of disharmony is when the abuser's in a really bad spot. But that really bad spot can also just occur in a normally healthy relationship where one of the two partners is just in a bad spot. Let's just kind of look for a moment what bad spots look like to people because this is just so common and we want to have complete entire respect for the reality that people are not in the same spot all the time and they can really get out of sync because they're just feeling really bad. The things that I want you to pay attention to is that are one of you feeling disharmonious and the other one's just feeling happy? And so the, the, the harmony cannot occur between you because one of you is happy for whatever reason and the other one's discontent for whatever reason. You're in different spots, so there's not harmony. And so the happy person may totally miss what's going on with the discontent partner or the discontent partner may actually try to drag down the happy partner. That's what I'd like you to remember is that the discontent partner might just be so upset that the partner's happy, they might try to pull that happy person out of the clouds and just kind of drag them down into the mire of discontent. And you, you want to be kind of aware, gee, am I doing that? Another thing is that one person might have just had a great day and the other person had a bad day. It's just like two different existences. You don't spend every moment of your day together and you're two separate human beings. Another aspect is one may be kind of giddy. And I often find that people are kind of giddy and silly when they're inebriated. But what is interesting is that the other person might be really irritated because they're sober and they're, they're trying to cope with the, the inebriated individual. But even beyond that, one may have to stay sober because that's just their commitment. The other one might get inebriated and that's what they do. And they're totally out of sync because their brains are out of sync. One's 
sloshing and the one is, uh, one is not. And that can cause a disharmony as well. So what I would like all couples to pay attention to is that if you are in more disharmony due to substance use, and it leads to more arguments between the two of you, you actually probably have slipped into substance abuse, where the substance itself is causing you to slip out of consciousness at being kindly and respectfully conscious at that time, and it can be an issue. Okay, going on though, you know, one of you may be sick, maybe disabled, maybe somehow hampered, and the other one might be healthy, and that big disharmony there, the healthy one may be overly taxed and taking care of the sick one, or the healthy one may have all this vigor and want to go out and do all sorts of things and not share the experience of life with the one that's sick that can't. That creates disharmony. Or the sick person may want to bring down the healthy person so that the sick one can have connection. All that occurs. Another situation may call, come about in healthy and unhealthy relationships is that one may need to spend more time alone while the other one may need to connect. One may have a little bit more of a sense of needing to be in their cave and or isolated or regroup themselves or collect their emotional energies. and Maybe they're not quite as socially energized when they're around people, so they need to kind of like gain their own personal identity, their own personal space, their own personal head, in order to have the capacity to really enjoy connecting. But the other one may always want to connect and never be separated from the other person. And that type of disharmony can occur in relationships as well. And another one, one may feel chronically depressed or anxious, and the other one may feel chronically cheerful and optimistic. And so the optimist may try to move the depressed person out of their depression. Sometimes the depressed person might come and harmonize with that optimistic person. But the reverse is also to the depressed and anxious person might try to pull the cheerful and optimistic person into the darkness of their depression and anxiety because, you know, the, the old statement, misery loves company, but more importantly, people love connection no matter what state that they're in. Also be aware that disharmony is really, really intensified when one of the partners is carrying a really heavy burden and they do not feel like it's being shared by the other person. And those heavy burdens are dealing with money, working extra hours, or really having to be taxed by a high level of child raising responsibilities. And the other one may feel carefree, their schedule may be more enjoyable, and they may not be really mindful of the money pressures. And I definitely see a huge amount of stress and disharmony occurs as soon as a loving couple has a child. And there's like this harmony, you know, maybe there might be for you a little bit of honeymoon period when your child is first born, but if one is left to raise the child and the other one's out, it actually is harder to hang out with a child and be alone in that process than it is to go to work. <laughs> often. It really depends on the work, too, but often. And so when the person that's gone to work wants to come home and relax and chill out, the person who's been with the child predominantly says, I just can't take this. I'm so exhausted. You need to take over. And the one that's gone to work says, but wait a minute. I'm supposed to come home and relax. I've been working all day. When the child says, I've been working all day, this is 24-7, this is really awful. And then suddenly there is this disharmony. And I see this all the time. I often will ask couples, when did your complications occur? How old were your children at the time? And it is usually that the, that the disharmony occurs sometime in the first year of the first child's life and exacerbated at the third year of the child's life, especially if another one was added. Just a need to take be beware of that and then also know that you know one is abusive and the other one is abused creates huge disharmony in relationships and that of course is an abusive relationship now one thing that's motivating me to present this under the shelter of paths to recovery after abuse and trauma is that individuals after abuse and trauma would love to be in a good relationship but it's hard to discern after being abused, when disharmony means there just needs to be solutions and love and understanding and respect, and when disharmony is a frightful precursor to uh, the possibility of being abused. And it's when that disharmony is present that it sometimes triggers an, uh, an anxiety and even a defensiveness in anticipation that, that they're about to be abused. And so I wanted to present these ideas about living 
with harmony and disharmony in a relationship so that everyone could truly understand what it is they are going through when they're out of sync. You know, when you're out of sync, life is disorganized, you're on different wavelengths, you're disagreeing, you're feeling differently than the other person is, you will be blasting out your energies, your attitudes, and your words in ways that will create even more disharmony with the other person. And that's natural. If you're aware that that's the state that you're in, it is so wonderful to say, honey, I am just in a really bad mood and I need to reshuffle myself, reorganize myself. I need to reconfigure this. I love you. I will come back to this discussion. I will come back. And then, of course, you do need to come back. And sometimes it's really, in fact, often it's really helpful to come to a place with a life coach, a couples coach, a marriage counseling counselor. I do all of that so that they can become the mediator between the two of you so that you can deal with the disharmonies in a way that moves you back into synchronicity. Because in the best of relationships, you have to remember, two people are synchronized often. They flow together and they have enough of the flow, the time together to feel like they are forming a good team and that it is in harmony often enough that both people feel positive about the relationship, they feel connected, and they feel peaceful, and they're sharing the burdens of the relationship. When it moves into disharmony is when you need to be the wisest you possibly can to know how you need to call for your space, to know when it's time to wait to problem solve, but to always be respectful of yourself and the other person in word, action, and attitude. And that's the bottom line. Well, it's Dr. Carol Francis, and I do so very hope that you are moving into an ever more enjoyable relationship. And here's knowing that it's not always easy. Take care. Bye-bye.